are going to record. There it is. So we are going to record the meeting. So we would just ask that you mute your mics while we're speaking, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions and answers, period. So then at that point, um, you're welcome to unmute yourself. But if you're here, hopefully you're joining us for our Marianne Quarter Neighborhood Grant Workshop. Um, we'll get into this a little bit later, but we have had um, previous detailed workshops about different types of projects. So today we really just wanna focus on the overall application process and talk you through um, what can hopefully make a successful grant application for you. So the neighborhood grant program itself um, was created in 1994 by our mayor and council. And the idea is really put it up to neighborhoods. Where do you wanna see improvements in your neighborhood? Where would you like us to invest uh, money. And so this really, um, as neighbors, allows you that opportunity to identify projects that are a benefit, um, talk to your neighbors, you know, kind of as a community process as well, you know, see what's needed and then put in an application and what's in it is outside then the city's kind of larger capital projects, uh, which can be multi-million and uh, multi-year. So currently uh, in this fiscal year, which we work from July to June, we have 350,000 that's available. Um, when needed, we do have additional funds for projects that meet special criteria for water conservation. It varies each year if those are used. The maximum grant amount per association is $20,000. You'll see there on the screen, a map of uh, some of the distribution of funds. I think it's a couple years out of date now, but kind of gives you an idea of where our associations are that have applied for grants and where that funding has gone. Um, our eligible applicants are our neighborhood and homeowner associations as well as our crime-free multi-housing um, buildings. And for our HOAs and our crime-free properties, we, there is a match of at least 25% of the requested funds. And again, as I mentioned, who can apply? This is a map that shows more just the associations, not, as, uh, not the amounts that have been funded, but where they're located. We have our voluntary neighborhood associations, our homeowner associations, and then again, our multifamily communities um, that are in our crime-free program through crime prevention. So the idea behind the grant program is really that we're investing in projects that benefit the entire neighborhood. Um, it's not for individual homeowner improvements, but something that does benefit the neighborhood. Uh, One-time expenditure, so you get a year to complete it. Uh, we'll go over the timeline later, but um, as I mentioned, our fiscal year runs July to June, so the funding becomes available in July and then needs to be spent by the end of the fiscal year. For our homeowner associations and our crime-free properties, the funds cannot be used for maintenance projects, so really um, part of the, what makes the successful grant application is being able to tell that story of, you know, how is this not maintenance? How is this uh, an improvement or enhancement to the community outside of what we collect our dues for and normally maintain? And then the project is just for the one-time expenditure. So then it's up to the community to figure out how to keep uh, the project maintained. And then as far as community involvement goes, um, this is a lot of times probably the, the largest reason why grants may not be funded is they aren't able to demonstrate that there was involvement from all of our community members. Uh, now, as practitioners ourselves in this type of work, uh, we understand that not everyone will come out and you, know, you can do your best and you still might only hear from a uh, few of your neighbors, but what we wanna see is that it was demonstrated that you tried so uh, for our associations, you have defined boundaries. You need to make sure that all the households within those boundaries were invited to participate. Did they get a chance to talk about what projects they might think should be funded? Or if you brought ideas to the table, was there, was there that opportunity for them to give input um, into what that looked like? And then um, selecting kind of what project you do wanna apply for the funds for. And so that does have to actually be shown with the application. In some of the technical pieces, uh, you'll see we have an application form and we're gonna go over some of the resources and uh, where to find this online, but it's uh, a PDF fillable that you can fill in or reach out to neighborhood services staff and we're happy to print one for you if you need that hard copy. 
um, to write in, but whichever way is easiest for you, uh, we can, we're there to assist. For all of our project types, um, you'll see that bids are required. We need to show that the amount you're asking for is, uh, relates to the actual cost of what the project um, will cost. Uh, the application is how you guys are telling your story of what's needed in your community. So pictures are huge. Um, you need to make sure that when uh, our team is reviewing the applications that it really does tell that story of here's what the community looks like. Here's um, kind of our vision for what we're trying to do through the improvement. So pictures are great. Um, and then again, that proof of community involvement. Now, again, there are specific mandatory requirements for the type of project that you're gonna ask for funds for. And then that's where really, um, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but some of those workshops and um, guidelines we produce really are helpful. So here's those resources that I was mentioning. Um, the landing page really for everything and anything is tempe.gov slash neighborhood grants. Again, we have guidelines by project type, frequently asked questions for that. Um, We'll go over this when we talk about some of our previous completed projects, but what we're doing right now is sharing information that we know based on um, grant applications from 1994 on. The idea behind this program is really that neighborhoods say, hey, this is what we'd love to see in our neighborhood. So you may think of a project that we haven't funded before and, and that's okay. Reach out, we can talk it through with you. And when we share these guidelines, it's based on past experience, but it's not meant to be all inclusive because, um, you know, without a neighborhood thinking of it, we wouldn't have had public art in our neighborhoods, or we may not have had um, some of our other projects that have uh, shown up because it took someone to think about it and say, hey, can I do this? Um, and then it becomes um, some of our more typical grants. And then again, online from our grant workshops, very specific to the different topics types of projects you could apply for, uh, recordings of all those presentations, as well as if it's easier for you to just visually go through the presentations um, versus watching the recording, those are all there in, or just to refer back to as you're going through the process. So, uh, sorry, Laura, if you just go back real quick, I wanted to let them know sure. something new this year. Oh, that's okay. Something new this year is we have a recording of our data workshop. So for those of you who were able to join us at that, it was just a great resource from our um, GIS, our mapping staff here in Tempe. They walk you through of how to access all the open data that the city has. And that again, really helps strengthen your grant application. And we'll talk a, lot, a little bit about this when we talk about types of projects, but you can find um, information as far as related to trees in your neighborhood, um, some of when we go to the next section and talk about what's evaluated, there's some equity layers even to see who makes up your neighborhood. Um, so anything like that, that just helps you, again, tell the story of what project your neighborhood wants to apply for, and as well as just how that can really help um, enhance the neighborhood. So then when it comes to evaluation, um, this is the criteria. And all of this is, um, again, gonna be online. It already is online with our grant application. So um, you have access to this, it's all, it's all there, but uh, really we're looking at impact, the project you're asking for funding for, is it accessible, equitable to all? Um, does it again, benefit the entire neighborhood? Might complement existing neighborhood amenities, um, looking at the environmental benefit, you know, water conservation, energy conservation, shade, anything like that, that helps as well. Health and safety of residents. And then for the actual application, when we're looking at the quality of it, relating again to some of those bids, have you shown an accurate budget? Is the money you're asking for enough? Is it too much? Is it, is it the right amount to make sure that you have a successful project in the end? Um, we want to be able to understand what you're applying for. Again, when you turn in the application, that's what funding decisions are made off of. So the clearer your project is, um, the better. We should know uh, what you want to do, you know, where the project is going in, you know, some of those details. And then again, with the application, just making sure you're following all those mandatory requirements and that the neighborhood was included. Um, and then the ability gets to, can the project be done during the fiscal year? 
we appreciate all of our neighbors and, and we have some great uh, dreamers who come up with some great projects, but we do need to make sure that it fits within um, the $20,000 limit as well as being able to be completed in a year. Now you will have some projects that um, build on each other. So you might um, just, for example, in a neighborhood plant shade trees one year. And you might have an ultimate vision of getting a tree in every single household's front lawn. But, uh, you know, it may take, okay, the first year you planted, other neighbors see it. Hey, how did you get that tree? Oh, that's right. You asked me if I wanted one. Well, I do now. So it's not that the projects can't um, end up being multi-year, but really what in the application it has to address is that it really is just that one-time grant. Uh, and then you, again, if you have vision for future years or out years, um, you're welcome to share that in, in your application, but understand for the grant purposes, we really need to see that this is a complete phase that can be completed in one year. And that if multi-year asks don't happen, that it still is a great project that benefits the neighborhood um, that can still add something without future funding. And then again, it should show the maintenance. So this is a graph of the timeline. Um, and you can, if, hopefully if you have a big screen, you can read some of that. But again, this is online. So then you guys can kind of see that um, as well when you go online. And this is just a basic timeline. Um, some of it can happen concurrently. Some of it, um, you know, you'll need to have happen prior to the next steps. But really now is the time where you should be talking to your neighborhood, you know, talking through projects, what's going to work. A big piece of that is talking to city staff. You know, we, in the end, uh, want it to be a successful grant application. We've got great staff on hand that um, specialize in their areas and or just are here to help you as well. So um, reach out if you run into any problems getting hold of anyone. Uh, neighborhood services, we're here to help you through the entire process. Uh, you have access to all of our direct contact information um, that's on the website as well as usually if you're attending one of these, you'll know you get emails from us all the time. So reach out to us. We can put you in contact with someone um, if you aren't able to get a hold of them, um, but make sure that that's all happening. And then also, um, as we've mentioned around quotes and bids and funding, um, you know, start talking to people now. Um, You'll see some requirements there based on uh, the amount you're asking for is the number of bids. Something to keep in mind is uh, we have had neighborhoods struggle over the last couple of years uh, with the pandemic, getting a hold of businesses or just businesses providing a quote. Um, kind of like your community involvement, some of it will be demonstrating the effort was made. So if you're to require three bids, you've done everything you could and you could only get two bids, reach out. Let's talk it through. Don't give up or say, hey, I can't turn in the application, you know, there, you know, we'll help you um, explain that in your application to where you can still submit. And then again, during the spring, prepping that application, uh, putting it all together. Uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but neighborhood services just isn't your resource. We also have um, other neighborhoods that have been uh, successful grant applic applicants. And we've had um, them offer to step up. We have one of them on the line with us today and we can connect you with them just to say, hey, from a neighbor perspective, here's what we did that worked. Um, here's how we got our neighbors to show up or here's how we structured um, giving input into a project. And so they can be a great resource as well. So we're happy to also connect you with them um, as well as online you'll find our past applications that have been successful. So you can also see those. And so now let's see, so some of the fun um, projects that have been funded. Again, this isn't meant to be all inclusive. We're just sharing some examples if this helps uh, spark an idea for those of you talking to neighborhoods um, about grant projects, we're happy to go out, also uh, share this with them so they see it and can get some ideas. Or as I said, all of this is online. So you could also just pull it up and share it at a neighborhood meeting. Um, but if, sorry, Laura, if you just go back a little, just to talk about signage, oh. you're seeing examples there, both from uh, our HOAs, as well as our neighborhoods. Uh, some, a really easy one, if you go to the next one, Laura, sorry. 
Um, this will show you kind of in our voluntary neighborhoods, the signage that's been done um, for both our HOAs and our neighborhoods. Identifying your house in the front as well as in the back alley is helpful. And then for our voluntary groups, we do have the blue um, signs to identify the neighborhood when you don't have the opportunity for entry signage. And then this is some just different example of fencing. Um, I think we highlight it every year because it's one of our favorites, but uh, Juniper Village HOA at McClintock and Guadalupe is the top um, image. It's kind of a book, kind of a during, I guess, and then an after, but they added a accessible path to get to the complex that was behind them so that people could walk or bike instead of always um, driving because uh, originally the way the fencing was set up, um, it was on two major arterials. So people really weren't that comfortable walking to the commercial center, but now because they can cut through the neighborhood, it makes it a lot easier. And then some of the other uh, fencing just shows example of increasing some height as well as just adding some uh, crime prevention approved fencing um, in some areas for different access issues. Um, are fixing up your arterial walls. Um, you'll see here that that can include landscape as well as um, some enhancements to the actual wall for aesthetics. Here's some examples of lighting. Um, you'll see some solar as well as just different pathway or community lighting. Um, you'll have people that will switch out as well to the LED, the low energy use as well. Here we have our landscape. Again, it doesn't have, um, there is some money for water conservation. We've got great water conservation staff that will talk you through this. Um, our Xeriscape, they, you can do some beautiful work with different plantings and um, having a lot of color still there, but reducing your water usage. And so here's just some examples of that. And then here are some additional ones as well. Um, street trees to provide shade. These ones can show you um, really the growth. Now these are planted on individual homeowner, but you can see that there is that community benefit in both the shade they um, provide uh, citywide, kind of helping our urban canopy. And then as well, the city does have some climate goals. And so this really, the trees all help in that. So even though they may be planted on private property, you do can demonstrate a community benefit. And in this case, in the neighborhoods, it's offered to everyone. It's not just one or two people that get trees. It's offered to the whole neighborhood. Hey, would you like a street tree? And then we work with you with our urban forester as far as type of tree that might be appropriate for the area and or that would provide good shade. And this just shows you the impact over that 15 year time period of when planted to the shade it provides today. Um, for many of our neighborhoods, uh, the neighborhood grants is a great way to get art in their neighborhood. If it's on city property or city right of way or city parks, any kind of city land, uh, we do have a pre-qualified artist list. You can find that online. Um, and then if it is on private property, you are still welcome to use the pre-qualified artist list, but it's not required. And then when funded through the grant program, it does become um, part of our public art collection. And so that helps with maintenance and you work very closely uh, with our uh, public art coordinator. That one on the previous page is our latest one that was just funded this past year. Um, and that's on the El Paso path in the Optimus Park neighborhood. And then the other slides show examples of um, additional public art that's been done uh, for some of our flood irrigated neighborhoods. They have the existing uh, concrete stamp pipes that have been enhanced. Um, for others, you can see they've done something as simple as bike racks or uh, an artist designed chair that's at an orbit stop or artist designed shade. And so um, you can get creative with that. And the uh, pre-qualified artist list gives you some examples of work done that might also help you with ideas. And here's some uh, other examples of um, irrigation stamp pipes. You can see the variety, uh, different types of artists are all gonna have a different take. And so, um, even in the materials that they're using. Um, for our parks, a lot of our parks can be community spaces. The one thing that we do like to highlight with our city parks is that we do have a park plan. So your mayor and council are investing 
uh, millions of dollars each year in our city parks. And we have a park plan that shows for your neighborhood park any upcoming improvements. So the grant program is not, um, you know, kind of intended to fund huge capital investments and or to fund something that might have to be torn out because we're coming in and giving you a brand new playground in a year. So this guide really helps you as far as knowing um, what could be done. Um, our park staff work very closely with you uh, because they'll take on maintenance. It is something where they do have to approve what you're putting in. Um, but you'll see um, with the pictures that there's still a lot of opportunity to improve parks with the neighborhood grants. So here's just some examples of things that have been done. Um, some seating, picnic areas, uh, fitness equipment, shade, uh, meditation garden in one of our parks. Um, we had Mitchell Park actually had an old concrete pad. So the skate park you see there was doable for the grant amount. Um, if we had to pour that concrete pad, it may not be. But in this case, uh, sometimes if you look at your park, you'll have, park, you'll have existing infrastructure. Um, all of our grants, we should mention, have to be accessible to everyone. So especially you'll see that reflected in our parks where um, you'll have the ADA pass put in. And so you'll see that's what that is on that far left. Um, we've had chess tables and, and this picture doesn't show, but the one seating is accessible um, for the chess table built there. Bike racks can be put in, trees can be planted. And the next, Laura. Um, for some of our others, this shows you examples of traffic calming. Um, again, the grants aren't meant to circumvent any other existing city process. So for some of these, um, you still have to meet our speed counts, our traffic counts that might be required. You still have to get some signatures. But what is great about it is it is a funding source to where um, you can still get those traffic calming measures put in. So these are just some examples of speed humps as well as some um, entry medians that were put in. Roundabouts where they've been able to be put in. Um, for the amount that you can get through the grant, um, there isn't water to, or I'm sorry, there isn't funding usually to run water. So you've seen some great use of native plants um, that have used water harvesting or other means to get those established and going. And then again, as I said, someone has to come up with the idea first. And so we've had some great um, innovative ideas from our residents um, over in the Clark Park in Maryland and neighborhoods. You'll see the garden over at Clark Park has used some grant funds. Um, one of my favorite projects again is uh, the Victor Acres and Escalante neighborhoods did a history, an oral history of the neighborhood. And at the time they were able to um, do them, they actually produced hard copies for every resident in those neighborhoods that wanted them. And then that uh, has a place in our history museum as well. Um, and then more recently, we had um, our downtown neighborhoods combined. Something I should mention that I don't think I have before. If you are adjacent neighborhoods and have a shared community area or interest, you can combine resources. So for example, if you're each eligible for 20,000, uh, you can, if there's two of you, you could apply for a $40,000 project. And in this case, we had some neighborhoods in the downtown area come together and put together a traffic mitigation study. Okay, next. And so now uh, we'll open up to questions. Laura, if you wanna, I think I can see the chat pretty well. Um, okay. Hang on, I will yeah. do that. Okay, let's see. Well, the first question we have is Linda. Uh, she has two questions. We have a partial shade structure. It needs a new roof, and we'd like to add some permanent furniture under it. Would this be something we could apply for a grant for? Have you added security cameras to the grant yet? And so as far as, um, sorry, Linda, I'm not sure when you say we have shade, I assume maybe if that's in your park or somewhere else. But yeah, we have done seating. We've done shade. Um, and again, the main thing with those is just that it does have to be accessible. So um, if we're putting grant funds into it and the existing seating, for example, isn't, then that would have to include some kind of concrete pathway, possibly a concrete pad. Um, but that's where we can get you in contact with staff that can go through some of those specific details depending on where it's located. Okay. 
Yeah, who can I talk to on staff? This one, and this is uh, Linda Artak, not Linda Knudsen. Shauna, you might have been thinking it was Linda. Oh, sorry, I just Knudsen. looked at participants. Yeah, Linda, is it on your private property? It is. It's right in front of our property. It's had a, it's got concrete pillars that are fine, and it's got a concrete pad and steps and everything. But we had to take the top off because it was all wood and it rotted. And so we want to do, uh, you know, you know, the new aluminum over the top of it, and then. Um, Put some permanent furniture in so people can actually use it to have a picnic or something like that in. Okay. Well, we will get you in contact. We have um, kind of new, not so new, but Nanette is our ADA coordinator now. So we'll make sure that we connect you with her um, as well as our uh, planning staff um, just to make sure that we're meeting all the HOA requirements. But she's a great resource and she can help you with um, okay. any questions on how that might work. Yeah, and then put her in touch with me. Mm -hmm. Yep, we can do that. Wonderful, because I, I, we have our board meeting on Thursday, and I really like to get some info before the meeting so I can talk to the homeowners. Great. So security cameras, I don't know that that's one we've done before, but I think it might fit in. What do you think, Sean? I think it fits our requirements. Uh, we haven't done security cameras before. Um, I want to say the only time we had someone ask, it was a multifamily property, and honestly outside of the actual project type. They just hadn't done the community involvement piece that was needed um, because, you know, demonstrating obviously that it's uh, a neighborhood project that the community supports is a big piece of it. So mm -hmm. um, I would just encourage you, Linda, you know, Ryan Cook's your crime prevention officer and he sits on our grant panel. So, you know, if you reach out to him and talk that, that through with him as well as just um, then can demonstrate the community support and all those pieces, we could consider it, but we haven't had uh -huh. an actual application, I should say. Because uh, that's a big one for us. Ryan Cook? Yes. And I can find him on Tempe.gov? Yes. Yeah, and again, we, we're making notes, so we can also, Linda, just connect you with him and let him know that you had a question about that. Yeah, I'd love to talk to him. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies. You bet. Uh, okay, we have one from Frida. She asks, why are we doing trees on private property when APS and SRP offer trees, offer free trees? Sure, so there's many resources for trees. Um, the city also has a healthy budget for urban forestry. Um, I think the idea is here with the neighborhood, if they move forward, it's, you know, they can do it all together. They can put the trees in. Um, if a neighborhood wanted to pursue it through one of the utilities. Um, I, you know, I'm, I know with their tree programs, there's some different requirements that are great <laughs> that you sit, go through some workshops and, you know, and they help you identify placement as well. And so that's just another resource that you could also get trees through as well. Okay, we have a comment. Jonah, about... Sorry, this is Elizabeth Thomas with Neighborhood Services as well. I would just add to the trees question. Um, HOA communities sometimes have a number of trees that have a certain lifespan and then they lose them unfortunately due to natural causes because the lifespan of different tree species. There's also been different weather events, acts of God if you will, that have created issues sometimes with the number of trees that were lost through no fault of the HOA or sometimes through individual homeowners that have a tree that gets diseased. Another nice thing is when there's a tree project, they can work with the arborist, um, applicants can, and they also um, can diversify their tree plantings, which makes for a healthier environment as well. Or they can also look at adding them to the local park if they have agreement from the park staff. Thank you. Okay, we had a quick comment from Linda Knudsen that the skate park at uh, Mitchell School is really well used and it's cool to see a project like that. Um, Frida from Clark Park said, uh, in Clark Park, we tried to do an entry sign at 13th and Farmer, southeast corner. We couldn't get a definitive direction because we couldn't find out who owned the land, Tempe versus Union Railroad. Who should our contact be? Yeah, I remember this one, Frida. It was a difficult one um, because it, it's so old uh, and your, pro, your actual community developed before it was actually in the city of Tempe. It was in the county, I believe, was one of our problems. Um, we can offline work through that again with you if you want to pursue that. Um, okay. 
Okay, let's see. Will the city provide drip irrigation for any new planters installed with the funds of a neighborhood association grant? Yes, so actually with the trees, well, it, I guess it varies, but you do have to identify how the trees would be watered. And in a lot of case, um, I know, for example, the cost of it going in a park, they include the drip irrigation line. Right. And you have to show that the tree will stay healthy. Yeah. And for example, Michael, if you're in an HOA and that's to a planter box, yeah, you could definitely include that. Now, whether we would pay for drip irrigation on you know, a private yard, I don't know. That would be one we'd have to really talk through. We have not done that to date. Okay, and John has a question. John, go ahead and ask. Uh, yes, thank you. Am I, un am I unmuted? I hope you, you are, John. Okay. Um, the board has begun a very, very preliminary discussion of using, of a, putting forward a proposal for landscaping. Let me tell you what our, uh, co my concern is at this point. We've gotten some preliminary um, proposals from landscapers to do uh, what I would call renovation of our landscaping a do over of our landscaping. Our landscaping, as you know, since we're part of the lakes is very green, uh, which is something that's becoming harder and harder to sustain uh, going forward. The problem is that what a landscape architect puts forward, at least the ones we have seen so far, would exhaust the grant in and of itself. And simply that would produce a plan and you mentioned earlier about these projects being complete unto themselves and to produce a plan without any tangible outcome struck me as not a very fundable alternative. So what I'm looking at instead is how can we within the confines of the grant both design and implement and about the only way we might be able to do that is to subdivide the community to work on just a portion in the uh, in this particular funding year. I wonder what your ideas might be uh, on that. Um, yeah, you might need to scale it, you know, to fit the twenty thousand um, dollars. The other thing is maybe we'll be able to help you with finding the original uh, landscape plan for your area. So maybe uh, we, would be. Uh, just a yeah, minute. We've had the planning department working on that now for about six months and finally got an email yesterday uh -huh. that the plans no longer exist. Yeah, that does happen, especially when it was built probably, what, in the 70s, I'm going to guess? In the, in the 70s. Now, yeah. one of the uh, individuals that I spoke to was the successful um, uh, bidder on the uh, landscaping renovation that was done at Runaway Point, which is part of our Lakes HOA. And uh, he made an argument for what he calls uh, backward engineering. I know that probably makes no sense to basically go in on the basis of certain principles, such as in our case, uh, uh, rocking areas that are too, are too small to water, to water successfully without wasting water, uh, a, a different type of treatment for areas that uh, watering causes damage to fences, uh, patio walls, and so forth. His suggestion was to come up with a series of principles to guide what he would call merely renovations of the uh, landscape with no elevation changes of, of any sort. And then a, a kind of reverse approach, then create uh, diagrams that would enable uh, the uh, city uh, planning department to understand what's being proposed and whether or not those plans were consistent with requirements. I, I hope I'm making some sense here. Uh, he, he, he basically said that's kind of the approach he took, uh, he took in his work, which was to kind of do it in reverse to develop, to develop visuals after uh, there was a sense of what were the goals that one was trying to accomplish in renovating the landscape. Yeah, I think that sounds like something that's potentially doable. I, you know, I would suggest that we probably set up a meeting with planning and you and start at the beginning and kind of talk through it and see where it takes us. But I, it sounds 
like it's doable. Yeah, that, that would make sense because I think a real challenge that all the communities within the lakes will be facing is, as you know, it's uh, the lakes have been traditionally green and that's not going to be sustainable going forward. So we have to look at other ways of staying green that are uh, not just big areas of, of grass. Uh, and that's something we need to consider. That such, setting up such a meeting would be would be very very uh, uh, helpful because, for example, we had a we had a vendor propose to redo uh, the uh, to map out the existing community, and that alone was ten thousand right. dollars, and struck me as not a good use of money. Mm -hmm. When what we're talking about here is is reno renovations or adjustments to existing. Uh, landscaping with the purpose of, of making sure that landscape is more sustainable going forward and that we can save water. Sure. Well, we will get with you after this meeting and we'll put something together. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that very much. Absolutely. Okay. So Michael says, to be more specific, who would pay the monthly water bill for plants located in planters on public property? So Michael, are you talking about by public property like a city park or city right of way, or are you talking about kind of public areas within an HOA? No, uh, on the right of way, okay. we are considering, we would like to put in traffic calming uh, chicane. Mm -hmm. uh, and this would be um, ideal if we could landscape it with some pretty plants that, uh, uh, would make the neighborhood even more attractive. But the question is, how are we going to irrigate those plants? Yeah, and Shauna, you can jump in if I'm wrong here, but typically we do not do that because that would require putting in a meter and who would pay for the water. So typically we are using a low impact design where water actually flows from the street or from the sidewalk or adjacent property to water those plants. And sometimes in some of the neighborhoods, like especially I think in downtown and maybe in Gentilly, maybe Hudson Park, sometimes the neighbors have to that first year sort of augment the, the water themselves, you know, just actually drag out there either a hose or buckets or whatever till they get established and those desert plants can survive on their own. But yeah, typically it's pretty expensive to, you know, run water line to a traffic calming um, strategy and you know, then we'd have to put in a meter and that becomes somewhat problematic. Uh, thank you, that, that is helpful advice. And our neighborhood association members will certainly help take care of these yeah. uh, plants, but I was concerned that the application might look yeah. weak if we didn't have a, a, a confirmed source of water that, you know, uh, uh, we can a show water, you. water meter. Right, we can show you some examples of neighborhoods that have done it, you know, and what it looks like so that it might be a little more clear to your um, neighbors. We can give you some pictures and show how that can work. Thank you very much. You bet. And Michael, this is Shauna. We can also touch base with you offline and um, some of it will depend on the, uh, the type of street that it's installed at. So sometimes we've had those where it's in front of neighbors' homes, whereas Laura mentioned then the alternative there is as she described, you know, other times we've had it um, on what we reference as a collector street, but maybe a bigger city street that has more traffic where the city has existing meters and water lines. So it just varies. It's hard to know without exact location, um, but for the most part, they've been self-sustained and not um, including any kind of water metering or anything. Now, if it's for the others who might be thinking of a different type of um, project on city, right of way, for example, as Laura had said, in a park, or maybe you want to improve the arterial landscape outside your neighborhood, then that's where that maintenance and cost of water is taken on by that city department. And so that's why it is required you work closely with them. You get the sign off. Um, if it's in parks, they have to say, yes, we will put that in and we will maintain and pay for water. If it's arterial, arterial landscape, for example, on rural road, and we already have landscape and you want to add to it, um, you know, then that's Again, something you work with our right of way coordinator and then they say, yes, we're able to take it on, we can maintain it and we can afford the water. So those are all pieces that go into it. Um, if you're just thinking of a different project than as Michael described. Okay, and we have one from Barb in Tempe South Mountain. 
she says she has also uh, encountered this issue as they are an older neighborhood with monument signs at their entry points. We desired a small median at an entry off 48th Street, just desiring to use a sign similar to the previous Awatuki signage off of off the main roads. Our idea was Tempe neighborhood, please slow down. Once inside, we do have street toppers. We already have a smallish island at our entry off baseline where a possible like sign could go. We experience a lot of cut through as we're surrounded by commercial. Can we talk separately to someone? Yeah, absolutely, Barb. We can set something up. Uh, probably going to be with um, traffic engineering as well, since it would be uh, in a median. Is there anything you want to add to that, Shauna? Uh, no, we can. I know. Um, yeah, you know what she's. We've talked, talked with Barb. Yep. Mm. So we can kind of talk through some of that. And for those of you um, in neighborhoods where you're looking at some of those, you know, there are going to be times when projects just, we can try, but may not be doable depending on um, the right of way, whose it is. Um, for some of you, those entries, um, especially when it's on a wall, for example, residents are all responsible for your own walls. So even though it may face an arterial or may look like it should be a shared city wall, a lot of times it belongs to that homeowner. And so there they have to give you express permission. We wouldn't, for example, go hang a sign on someone's wall without them saying that it was okay. And so sometimes uh, we're here and we're happy to help you with it, but sometimes there will be roadblocks like that. Um, and, and just something to keep in mind as you're moving forward with projects is you know, that individual homeowner does still at times have to give permission for some of those improvements if they are the actual owner of the uh, thing you're improving, like a backside of a wall even if it's on an arterial. And then we have another one from Barb. She says, trees, do we worry about tree roots getting into sewer lines? Are trees desert style, no big roots? Um, I guess I would say we work really closely with, our, um, with Richard Adkins to make sure we're choosing the right type of tree that we help you with that choice. And yeah, absolutely. We don't want them getting into sewer lines. Everything would have to be blue staked if you're too close to a water or sewer line, we might ask you to put in a root barrier. Um, but yeah, we would work through all those kinds of issues for sure. Yeah, and here at the city, we're very lucky. We have an urban forester who's Richard and he's yeah. great at identifying the right type of tree and kind of looking at those issues so that we aren't putting in anything that would cause other problems. And sometimes it's the placement, he'll scooch it over, um, but he's very good at that to let you know sometimes in front of a house, you may only get one tree instead of two because of those kinds of issues. And so that's where he helps you with that. I am not seeing any more right now. Anyone else have a question or anyone wanna be unmuted? I can, you can do that yourself actually. Can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> If someone is doing uh, zero escape uh, tree shade tree planting or other lands zero escape landscaping, can that be combined with water conservation funding? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. We've done a whole bunch of those kind of projects. A lot of times they're taking out a little bit of grass, uh, putting in more efficient uh, irrigation lines or sprinklers or that sort of thing and then maybe replacing plants. That's one of our most common grants, actually. Uh, may I ask a question? Go for it. Uh, I understand that our neighborhood association will have to pay for a design from traffic engineering, uh, the city's traffic engineering uh, department to uh, mm, design the layout of the chicane, chicane so that and to give us something that we would present to uh construction companies to get free bids yes uh, uh so the I, i'm assuming then the neighborhood associations have to pay up front in order to prepare the grant application and is that is that the way it's normally done so you wouldn't be paying your engineer who's going to stamp the plans ahead of time prior to getting the grant, you would just be proposing that as part of your grant. Does that make sense to you? So you're talking about the idea of it, not actually having a final design when you're applying. 
I don't know if I'm explaining that. Yeah, so your application, your bids oh. would be to say design, yeah. uh, you know, prepare construction drawings for chicanes at these locations. And then you'll know because if it's, if it's doable, is it 20,000? Is someone only going to charge you 10? And the cost of the chicane is 10. So that's part of it's really just getting the bids from people, not having them actually design it. Oh, well, can I get three bids from, I mean, contract uh, bids from three different construction companies without having it designed or presented to them? Well, part of what you'd be getting a bid on would be the designer. So, I mean, yes, you could explain, I think, to a construction company, uh, you know, show them a picture of roughly what your chicane would look like, you know, based on one somewhere else in the city. And I think they could probably give you a decent. OK, OK, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else not seeing any hands right now? Well, we still have some time. We can hang out here if anyone wants to uh, come up with a question or at this point, I think we're pretty much done with our presentation. Oh, here's another one from Barb. Ladies, those chicanes still fall under speed hump requirements for volume speed before pursuing calming, correct? Um, Barb, that's a good question. We're, we're kind of working through some of those things with the step manual right now. So probably we would uh, wanna have a, and, and I know Michael has been meeting with the traffic engineers already. So probably anyone wanting to do traffic calming, your first step's always gonna be to meet with them and see what the requirements are gonna be. We hate to give you, you know, some answer here that is not complete. So if that's something you wanna pursue, we're happy to set up that meeting. Barb, uh, this is Mike here, Shelton. And I, I think that we're gonna make our pitch that we may not have the high volume of traffic yet, but we have traffic that goes too fast when it does come through and uh, increasing number of children and so on. So there's a safety angle to it. And then, um, We'll appeal on, on uh, the grounds of more shade and uh, 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 innovative, uh, calming, uh, a pioneer neighborhood. Uh, I hope we can set an example for others to follow. <laughs> anyway, we, we won't, we're, we're not going to stress the fact that we're not, we don't have that, that high volume like Ash and Maple Street have. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank you for that, Michael. I think that's a, a good approach. Thank you. Thanks for a very good presentation. I, I, I was just putting it into the uh, chat. Uh, very helpful information. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. And we're, we're here for you guys. Uh, we're happy to set up those one-on-one -on -one meetings. I think sometimes we get a lot accomplished, especially on Zoom, um, when we put together the planners or the water conservation folks or whoever it might be and kind of talk through specifics before you apply. Okay. And Linda, I see your comment. We will, yes, set that meeting up with for you. Okay, well, we will put this recording um, on our grants page if you want to refer back to it, and the PowerPoint will be there as well if that's helpful. And please feel free to reach out. Thanks for coming, everybody. I'm going to end the recording at this point.
Uh, Melinda, we see that you uh, put in there that you arrived late. Um, yes, we'll have that recording posted uh, probably about by this time tomorrow. And please feel free to just give us a call if you want to um, ask something specific. Or you can ask it right now. We're still here. 